Chapter Ten of Fern's Hollow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fern's Hollow by Hesba Stretton. Chapter Ten, The Cabin on the Cinder Hill. The Cinder Hill cabin was situated at the mouth of an old shaft, long out of use, but said to lead into the same pit as that now worked, the entrance to which was about a quarter of a mile distant. The cabin was about the same size as the hut from which the helpless family had been driven, but the thatch wanted so much mending that Stephen and Martha were obliged to draw over it one of their patchwork quilts to shelter them for the night from the rain which was threatened by the gathering clouds the door from the hut at fern's hollow was fortunately rather too large instead of being too small for the doorway and william morris promised to bring them a shutter for the window place where there was no glass altogether the cabin was not very inferior to their old home but instead of the soft green turf and the fragrant air of the hills they were surrounded by barren cinder heaps upon which nothing would grow but the yellow colt's foot and a few weeds and the wind was blowing clouds of smoke from the lime kilns over and round the dismal cabin stephen with a profound silence that began to frighten martha made every arrangement he could think of for their comfort during the quickly approaching night and as soon as this was finished he washed and dressed himself as upon a sunday morning before going to meet miss anne in the red gravel pit he was leaving the cabin without speaking when little nan who had watched everything in childish bewilderment and dismay set up a loud pitiful cry which he soothed with great difficulty stevie going to live here said the little child at last with a deep sob ay little nan he answered for a bit darling please god we'll go home again some day but little nan shall always live with stevie that'll do won't it ay stevie sobbed the child and stephen kissing her tenderly put her on to martha's lap and walked out into the moonlight the clouds were hanging heavily in the western sky but the clearer heavens shone all the brighter by the contrast the mountains lay before him calm and immovable in the soft light and he could see the round outline of his own hollow at which his heart throbbed for a minute painfully but there was a hidden corner at the side of the cabin and there stephen knelt down to pray earnestly before he went farther on his errand until calm and quiet as the hills and as the moon which seemed to be gazing lovingly upon them he went on with a brave and steadfast spirit to the master's house botfield hall was a large half-timbered farmhouse with a gabled roof part of which was made of thatch and the rest of tiles it stood quite alone at a little distance from the works on the other side of them to that where the village was built the window casements were framed of stone and the outer doors were of thick solid oak studded with large-headed iron nails the iron ring that served as a wrapper on the back door fell with a loud clang from stephen's fingers upon the nails and startled him with its din so that he could hardly speak to the servant who answered his noisy summons they crossed the kitchen into which many doors opened to a kind of parlor beyond fitted up with furniture that looked wonderfully handsome and grand in stephen's eyes and where the master was sitting by a comfortable fire the impatient servant pushed him within the door and closed it behind her leaving him standing upon a mat and shyly stroking his cap round and round while the master sat still and gazed at him steadily with an assumed air of amazement though inwardly he was more afraid of the boy than stephen was of him it makes a coward of a man or boy to do anybody an injury pray what brings you here young fern he asked in a gruff voice sir said stephen firmly but without any insolence of manner 
i want to know who has turned us out of our own home is it the lord of the manor or you i've bought the place for myself answered the master bringing his hand down with a heavy blow upon the table before him as if he would like to knock stephen down with the same force there's nobody to sell it but me said the boy you think so my lad do you why if it were your own you would have no power over it till you were one and twenty but the place was your grandfather's and he has sold it to me for fifteen pounds when your grandfather returned from transportation his wife's hut became his and his right to it does not go over to anybody else till he is dead it never belonged to your father and you can have no right to it if you want to see the deed of purchase it is safe here witnessed by my brother thomas and jones the gameskeeper and your grandfather's mark put to it i would show it to you but i reckon with all your learning you would not make much out of it sir said stephen trembling grandfather is quite simple and dark he couldn't understand that you were buying the place of him besides he's never had the money what do you mean you young scoundrel cried the master i gave it into his own hands and made him put it into his waistcoat pocket for safety simple is he and dark he could attend his son's funeral four miles off only a few months ago and he can understand my niece anne's fine reading which i cannot understand myself ask him for the three five-pound notes i gave him if you have not had them already how long ago is it inquired stephen you can't remember said the master laughing well well jones left you a keepsake at your garden wicket for you to remember the day by stephen's face flushed into a wrathful crimson but he did not speak and in a minute or two the master said sharply come be off with you if you've got nothing else to say i have got something else to say answered stephen walking up to the table and looking steadily into his master's face god sees both of us and he knows you have no right to the place and i have i believe some day we'll go back again though you have pulled the old house down to the ground i don't want to make god angry with me but the bible says he seeth in secret and he will reward us openly the master shrank and turned pale before the keen composed gaze of the boy and his manly bearing but stephen's heart began to fail him and with trembling limbs and eyes that could scarcely see he made his way out of the room and out of the house down to the end of the shrubbery there he could bear up no longer and he sat down under the laurels shivering with a feeling of despair the worst was come upon him now and he saw no helper my poor boy said miss anne's gentle voice and he felt her hand laid softly on his shoulder my poor stephen i have heard all and i know how bitterly hard it is to bear stephen answered her only with a low half suppressed groan and then he sat speechless and motionless as if his despair had completely paralyzed him listen stephen she continued with energy you told me once that the clergyman at danesford had some papers belonging to you about the cottage you must go to him and tell him frankly your whole story i do not believe that what my uncle has done would stand in law and i myself if it be necessary would testify that your grandfather could not understand such a transaction but perhaps it could be settled without going to law if the clergyman at danesford would take it in hand for my uncle is very wishful to keep a good name in the country but if not stephen fern i promise you faithfully that should fern's hollow ever come into my possession and i be my uncle's only relative i will restore it to you as your rightful inheritance she spoke so gravely yet cheeringly that a bright hope beamed into stephen's mind and when miss anne held out her hand to him as a pledge of her promise she felt a warm tear fall upon it he rose up from the ground now and stood out into the moonlight before her looking up into her pale face stephen 
she said more solemnly than before do you find it possible to endure this injury and temptation i've been praying for the master answered stephen but there was a tone of bitterness in his voice and his face grew gloomy again he is a very miserable man said miss anne sighing i often hear him walking up and down his room and crying aloud in the night-time for god to have mercy upon him but he is a slave to the love of riches years ago he might have broken through his chain but he hugged it closely and now it presses upon him very hardly and all his love has been given to money till he cannot feel any love to god and he knows that in a few years he must leave all he loves for ever and go into eternity without it he will have no rest to-night because of the injury he has done you he is a very wretched man stephen i wouldn't change with him for all his money said stephen pityingly stephen continued miss anne you say you pray for my uncle and i believe you do but do you never feel a kind of spite and hatred against him in your very prayers have you never seemed to enjoy telling our father how very evil he is yes said the boy hanging down his head and wondering how miss anne could possibly know that ah stephen she continued god requires of us something more than such prayers he bids us really and truly to love our enemies love which he only can know of because it is he who seeth in secret and into the inmost secrets of our hearts i may hear you pray for your enemies and see you try to do them good but he alone can tell whether of a truth you love them i cannot love them as i love you and little nan replied stephen not with the same kind of love said miss anne in us there is something for your love to take hold of and feed upon but if ye love them which love you what reward have ye do not even the publicans the same your affection for us is the kind that sinners can feel it is of this earth and it is earthly but to love our enemies is heavenly it is christ-like for he died for us while we were yet sinners will you try to do more than pray for my uncle and black thompson will you try to love them will you try for christ's sake oh miss anne how can i he asked it may not be all at once she answered tenderly but if you ask god to help you his holy spirit will work within you only set this before you as your aim and resist every other feeling that will creep in remembering that the lord jesus himself who died for us said to us love your enemies he can feel for you for he was tempted in all points as we are as she spoke the last words they heard the master's voice calling loudly for miss anne and stephen watched her run swiftly up the shrubbery and disappear through the door there was a great bolting and locking and barring to be heard within for it was rumoured that mr wiley kept large sums of money in his house and no place in the whole countryside was more securely fastened up by day or night but stephen thought of him pacing up and down his room through the sleepless night praying god to have mercy upon him and yet not willing to give up his sin and as he turned away to the poor little cabin on the cinder hill there was more pity than revenge in the boy's heart End of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of Fern's Hollow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fern's Hollow by Hesba Stretton. Chapter Eleven Stephen and the Rector. Chapter Eleven. 
the report of the expulsion of the family from fern's hollow spread through botfield before morning and stephen found an eager cluster of men as well as boys and girls awaiting his appearance on the pit bank there was the steady step and glance of a man about him when he came a grave reserved air which had an effect upon even the rough colliers black thompson came forward to shake hands with him and his example was followed by many of the others with hearty expressions of sympathy and attempts at consolation it'll be put right some day said stephen and that was all they could provoke him to utter he went down to his work and though now and then the recollection thrilled through him that there was no pleasant ferns hollow for him to return to in the evening none of his comrades could betray him into any expression of resentment against his oppressor in the meantime miss anne did not forget to visit the cabin and cheer as well as she could the trouble of poor martha whose good and proud housewifery had kept fern's hollow cleaner and tidier than any of the cottages at botfield it was no easy matter to rouse martha to take any interest in the miserable cabin where the household furniture had been hastily heaped in the night before but when her heart warmed to the work in which miss anne was taking an active part she began to feel something like pleasure in making the new home like the old one as far as the interior went out of doors no improvement could be made until soil could be carried up the barren and steep bank to make a little plot of garden ground but within the work went on so heartily that when stephen returned from the pit half an hour earlier than usual for he had no long walk of two miles now he found his grandfather settled in the chimney corner apparently unconscious of any removal while both martha and little nan seemed in some measure reconciled to their change of dwelling moreover miss anne was waiting to greet him kindly stephen she said martha has found the three notes in your grandfather's pocket all safe you'd better take them with you to the clergyman at danesford and do what he advises you with them and now you are come to live at botfield you can manage to go to church every sunday even little nan can go and there is a night school at longville where you can learn to write as well as read it will not be all loss my boy the opportunity for going to danesford was not long in coming for black thompson and cole who were the chief colliers in the pit chose to take a play day with the rest of their comrades and the boys and girls employed at the works were obliged to play also though it involved the forfeiture of their day's wages always a serious loss to stephen this time however he heard the news gladly and carefully securing the three notes by pinning them inside his pocket he set out for his ten-mile walk across the tableland to the other side of the mountains where danesford lay his nearest way led straight by fern's hollow and he saw that already upon the old site the foundation was laid for a new house containing three rooms in everything else the aspect of the place remained unchanged there still hung the creaking wicket where little nan had been wont to look for his coming home until she could run with outstretched arms to meet him the beehives stood yet beneath the hedge and the bees were flying to and fro seeking out the few flowers of the autumn upon the hillside the fern upon the uplands just below the hollow was beginning to die and its rich red-brown hue showed that it was ready to be cut and carried away for fodder but a squatter from sir mother hill hut had trespassed upon stephen's old domain except this one man the whole tableland was deserted and so silent was it that the rustle of his own feet through the fading ferns sounded like other footsteps following him closely the sheep were not yet driven down into the valleys and they and the wild ponies stood and stared boldly at the solitary boy without fleeing from his path as if they had long since forgotten how the bilberry gatherers had delighted in frightening them stephen was too grave and manlike to startle them into a memory of it 
and he plodded on mile after mile with the three notes in his pocket and his hand closed upon them pondering deeply with what words he should speak to the unknown clergyman at danesford when he reached danesford he found it a very quiet sleepy little village with a gleaming river flowing through it placidly and such respectable houses and small clean cottages as put to shame the dwellings at botfield so early was it yet that the village children were only just going to school and the biggest boy turned back with stephen to the gate of the rectory stephen had never seen so large and grand a mansion standing far back from the road in a park through which ran a carriage drive up to a magnificent portico he stole shyly along a narrow side path to the back door and even there was afraid of knocking but when his low single rap was answered by a good-tempered looking girl not much older than martha his courage revived and he asked in a straightforward and steady manner if he could see the parson at which the servant laughed a little and after inquiring his name said she would see if mr lockwood could spare time to speak to him before long the girl returned and led stephen through many winding and twisting passages more puzzling than the roads in the pit to a large grand room with windows down to the ground and looking out upon a beautiful flower garden it was like the palace miss anne had spoken of for he could not understand half the things that were in the room only he saw a fire burning in a low grate the bars of it which shone like silver and upon the carpeted hearth beside it was a sofa where a young lady was lying and near to it was a breakfast table at which an elderly gentleman was seated alone he was a very keen shrewd-looking man and very pleasant to look at when he smiled and he smiled upon stephen as he stood awestruck and speechless at his own daring in coming to speak to such a gentleman and in such a place as this so you are stephen fern of fern's hollow said mr lockwood i remember christening you and giving you my own name thirteen or fourteen years since isn't it your mother had been my faithful servant for several years and she brought you all across the hills to danesford to be christened is she well my good sarah moore mother died four years ago sir murmured stephen unable to say any more poor boy said the young lady on the sofa father is there anything we can do for him that is what i'm going to hear my child replied mr lockwood stephen has not come over the hills without some errand now my boy speak out plainly and boldly and let me hear what has brought you to your mother's old master thus encouraged stephen with the utmost simplicity and frankness though with fewer words than martha would have put into the narrative told mr lockwood the whole history of his life to which the clergyman listened with ever-increasing interest as he noticed how the boy was telling all the truth and nothing but the truth even to his joining black thompson in poaching when he had finished mr lockwood went to a large cabinet in the room and bringing out a bundle of old yellow documents soon found among them the paper james fern had spoken of on his deathbed it was written by the clergyman living in longville at the time of old martha fern's death to certify that she had settled and maintained her settlement on the hillside without paying rent or having her fences destroyed for upwards of twenty years and that the land was her own by the usages of the common i don't know what use it will be said mr lockwood but i will take legal advice upon it that is i will tell my lawyer all about it and see what we had best do you may leave the case in my hands stephen but tomorrow morning we start for the south of france where my daughter must live all the winter for the benefit of the warm climate and i must go with her for she is my only treasure now can you live in your cabin till we come home will you trust yourself to me stephen i will not see a son of my old servant wronged please sir said stephen the cabin is good enough for us and we're near a church and the night school only i didn't like to break my word to father besides losing the old home we can all stay winter well 
i'll trust you sir but my work is dangerousome and please god i should get killed will you do the same for martha and little nan ay answered mr lockwood coughing down his emotion at the young boy's forethought and care for his sisters if it pleases god my boy you will live to make a right good true-hearted christian man but if he should take you home before me i'll befriend your sisters as long as i live i like your miss anne stephen but your master is a terrible rascal i fear yes sir said stephen quietly you didn't say much about him however replied mr lockwood smiling at his few words please sir i'm trying to love my enemies he answered with a feeling of shyness if i was to call him a rascal or any other bad word it'd throw me back like and it's very hard work anyhow i feel as if i'd like to do it sometimes you are right stephen said mr lockwood you are wise in keeping your tongue from evil speaking for therewith bless we god even the father and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of god out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing you have taught an old parson a lesson my boy you'd better leave your money with me until my lawyer gives us his opinion now go home in peace and serve your master faithfully but if you should need a friend before i return come here and ask for the clergyman who is going to take my duty i will tell him about you and he will help you until i come home that afternoon stephen retraced his lonely path across the hills in great gladness of heart and when he came to fern's hollow he leaped lightly down the bank against which the old stovepipe had been reared as a chimney and stood again on the side of the old hearth in the midst of the new walls of red bricks that were being built up how the master could remove the new house and restore the old hut was a question of some perplexity to him but his confidence in the parson at danesford was so perfect that he did not doubt for a moment that he could call fern's hollow his own again next spring End of chapter eleven chapter number twelve of fern's hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america fern's hollow by hesba stretton chapter twelve everybody at botfield was astonished at the change in stephen's manner so cheerful was he and light-hearted as if his brief manhood had passed away with its burden of cares and anxieties and his boyish freedom and gladsomeness had come back again the secret cause remained undiscovered for martha fluent in tongue as she was had enough discretion to keep her own counsel and seal up her lips as close as wax when it was necessary the people puzzled themselves in vain and black thompson left off hinting at revenge at to stephen even the master when the boy passed him with a respectful bow in which there was nothing of resentment or sullenness wondered how he could so soon forget the great injury he had suffered mr wiley would have been better satisfied if the whole family could have been driven out of the neighbourhood but there was no knowing what ugly rumours and inquiries might be set afloat if the boy went telling his tale to nobody knows whom upon the whole martha did not very much regret her change of dwelling though she made a great virtue of her patience in submitting quietly to it to be sure the cinder hill was unsightly and the cabin blackened with smoke and it was necessary to lock little nan and grandfather safely within the house whenever she went out lest they should get to the mouth of the open shaft where stephen often amused the child by throwing stones down it and listening to their rebound against the sides but still martha had near neighbors and until now she had hardly even tasted the luxury of a thorough gossip which she could enjoy in any one of the cottages throughout botfield moreover she could get work for herself on three days in the week to help a washerwoman who gave her ninepence a day besides letting little nan go with her and have as she said the run of her teeth she had her admirers too young collier lads 
who told her truly enough she was the cleanest neatest tidiest lass in all of botfield so martha fern regarded their residence on the cinder hill with more complacency than could have been expected the only circumstance which in her secret heart she considered a serious drawback was her very near neighborhood to miss anne stephen said martha one saturday night after their work was done i've been thinking how it's only thee that's trying to keep the commandments i'm not such a scholar as thee but i've heard the chapter read till it's in my head as well as if i could read it off book myself so i'm thinking i ought to love my enemies as well as thee and i've asked black bess to come and have a cup of tea with us to-morrow black bess exclaimed stephen with a feeling of some displeasure ah said martha she's always calling me ashamed to be heard but i've quite forgiven her and to-morrow i'll let her see i can make pikelets as well as her mother and we'll have out the three china cups only grandfather and little nan must have common ones i thought i'd better tell thee and then thee'lt make haste home from church in the afternoon black bess isn't a good friend for thee answered stephen who was better acquainted with the pit girl's character than was martha and felt troubled at the idea of any companionship between them but we are to love our enemies persisted martha and do good to them that hate us at any rate i asked her and she said she'd come i don't think it means we are to ask our enemies to tea said stephen in perplexity if she was badly off like and in want of a meal's meat it'd be one other thing i'd do it gladly and on a sunday too oh martha it doesn't seem right oh nothing's right that i do replied martha pettishly thee art afraid i'll get as good as thee and then thee cannot crow over me but i'll not spend a farthing of thy money depend upon it i'm not without some shillings of my own i reckon thee should let me love my enemies as well as thee i think but thee'lt want to go up to heaven alone next stephen said no more though martha continued talking peevishly about black bess she was not at all satisfied in her own mind that she was doing right but bess had met her at a neighbor's house where she was boasting of her skill in making pikelets and she had drawn out by her sneers and mocking to give her a kind of challenge to come and taste them she wanted now to make herself and stephen believe that she was doing it out of love and forgiveness towards poor bess but she could not succeed in the deception all the sunday morning she was bustling about and sadly chafing the grandfather by making him move hither and thither out of the way it was quite a new experience to have any one coming to tea and all her hospitable and housekeeping feelings were greatly excited by the approaching event when stephen with tired little nan riding on his shoulder returned from church in the afternoon they found bess had arrived and was sitting in the warmest corner close to a very large and blazing fire which filled the cabin with light and heat bess had dressed herself up in her best attire in a bright red stuff gown and with yellow ribbons tied in her hair which had been brought to a degree of smoothness wonderful to stephen who saw her daily on the pit bank she had washed her face and hands with so much care as to leave broad stripes of grime round her neck and wrists partly concealed by a necklace and bracelets of glass beads and her green apron was marvellously berated in a large pattern martha in her clean print dress and white handkerchief pinned round her throat was a pleasant contrast to the tawdry girl who looked wildly at stephen as he entered as if she scarcely knew what to do good evening bess he said as pleasantly as he could martha told me thee was coming to eat some pikelets with her so i've asked him to come too and after tea we'll have some rare singing i often hear thee on the bank bess and thee has a good voice bess colored with pleasure and evidently tried her best to be amiable and well-mannered sitting up nearer and nearer to the fire until her face shone as red as her dress with the heat martha moved triumphantly about the house setting the tea-table upon which she placed the three china cups with a gratified glance at the undisguised admiration of bess though three commons ones had to be laid beside them for as tim was coming stephen must fare like grandfather and little nan as soon as tim arrived she was very busy beating up the batter for the pikelets and then baking them over the fire and very soon the little party was sitting down to their feast bess declared politely between each piece pressed upon her by martha that she had never tasted such pikelets never at last when tea was quite finished and the table carefully lifted back to a safe corner 
at the foot of the bed though martha prudently replaced the china cups in the cupboard tim and stephen drew up their stools to the front of the fire and a significant glance passed between them now then stevie said tim thee learn me the new hymn miss anne sings with us and let's teach bess to sing it too bess looked around uneasily as if she found herself caught in a trap but as tim burst off loudly into a hymn tune in which stephen joined at the top of his voice she had no time to make any objection martha and the old grandfather who had been a capital singer in his day began to help and little nan mingled her sweet clear childish notes with their stronger tones it was a long hymn and before it was finished bess found herself shyly humming away to the tune almost as if she had been the chorus of one of the pit bank songs they sang more and more until she joined in boldly and whispered to martha that she wished she knew the words so as to sing with them but the crowning pleasure of the evening was when little nan sitting on stephen's knee with his fingers stroking her curly hair sang by herself a new hymn for little children which miss anne had been teaching her she could not say the words very plainly but her voice was sweet and she looked so lovely with her tiny hands softly folded and her eyes lifted up steadily to stephen's face that at last black bess burst out into a large and long fit of crying and wept so bitterly that none of them could comfort her until the little child herself who had been afraid of her before climbed upon her lap and laid her arms round her neck she looked up then wiped the tears from her face with the corner of her fine apron i had a sister once just like little nan she said with a sob and she minded me of her miss anne told me she was singing somewhere among the angels and i thought she looked like little nan but i'm afraid i shall never go where she is i'm so bad we'll teach thee how to be good answered martha thee come to me bess and i'll teach thee the hymns and the singing and how to make pikelets and keep the house clean on a week day i'm going to love my enemies and do good to them that hate me so don't thee be shy like we'll be friends like stephen and tim and weren't they enemies afore stephen learned to read that night as stephen lay down to sleep he said to himself i'm glad black bess came to eat pikelets with martha my chapter says whoever shall do the commandments and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven perhaps martha and me will be called great in heaven if we teach best how to do God's commandments. End of chapter 12Ferns Hollow by Hesba Stratton. Chapter 13. The Old Mine Shaft. Black Bess began to visit the Cinder Hill cabin very often. There was a fatal mistake, which poor Stephen, in his simplicity and single-heartedness, was a long time in discovering. Martha herself had not truly set out on the path of obedience to God's commandments, and it was not possible that she could teach Bess how to keep them. A Christian cannot be like a finger post, which only points the way to a place but never goes there itself she could teach best the words of the hymn and the tunes that they were sung too but she could tell her nothing of the feeling and of praise and love to the saviour with which stephen sang them and out of which all true obedience must flow with her lips she could say blessed are the poor in spirit and blessed are the meek and blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness but she cared for none of these things and felt none of their blessedness in her own soul and bess very quickly found out that she would far rather talk about other matters and because our hearts which are foolish and deceitful above all things and desperately wicked soon grow weary of good but are ever ready to delight in evil it came to pass that instead of martha teaching poor ignorant bess how to do god's will bess was leading her into all sorts of folly and wickedness it would be no very easy task to describe how unhappy stephen was when from day to day he saw martha's pleasant sisterly ways change into a rude and careless harshness and her thrifty cleanly habits give place to the dirty extravagance of the collier folk at botfield but who could tell how he suffered in his warm tender-hearted nature when he came home at night and found the poor old grandfather neglected 
and left desolate in his blindness and little nan herself severely punished by martha's unkindness and quick temper not that martha became bad suddenly or was always unkind and neglectful there were times when she was her old self again when she would listen patiently enough to stephen's remonstrances and miss and miss anne's gentle teaching but yet stephen could never feel sure when he was at his dismal toil underground that all things were going on right in his home overhead often and often as he looked up to fern's hollow where the new red brick house was now to be seen plainly like a city set on a hill he longed to be back again and counted the months and weeks until the spring should bring home the good clergyman to dainsford one day during the time allowed to the pit girls for eating their dinner bess came running over the cinder hills in breathless haste to the old cabin martha had been busy all the morning and was still standing at the washing tub but she was glad of an excuse for resting herself and when bess sprang over the door sill she received her very cordially martha martha cried bess come away quickly here's andrew the packman in the lane with such shawls martha blue and red and yellow and green only five shillings apiece and thee canst pay him a shilling a week come along and be sharp with thee i've got no money to spend said martha sullenly stephen ought to let grandfather go into the house and then we wouldn't be so pinched what with buying for him and little nan i've hardly a brass farthing in the world for myself i'd not pinch bess answered let stephen pinch if he will why all the lads in botfeld are making a mock at thee calling thee an old-fashioned piece and granny fern but come and look anyhow andrew will be gone directly bess dragged martha by the arm to the top of the cinder hill where they could see the pit girls clustering round the packman in the lane the black linen wrapper in which his pack was carried was stretched along the hedge and upon it was spread a great show of bright-coloured shawls and dresses and the girls were flitting from one to another closely examining their quality while andrews's wife walked up and down exhibiting each shawl by turns upon her shoulders the temptation was too strong for martha she wiped the soap suds from her arms upon her apron and ran as eagerly down to the lane as black bess herself eh here's a clean tight lass for you cried andrew comparing martha with the begrimed pit girls about him the best shawl in my pack isn't good enough for you my dear pick and choose just make your own choice and i'll accommodate you about the price i've got no money said martha oh you and me'll not quarrel about money replied andrew you make your choice and i'll wait your time i'm coming my rounds pretty regular and you can put up a shilling or two again i come without letting on to father but maybe you're married my dear no she answered blushing it's not far off i'll be bound he continued and with a shawl like this now you'd look like a full-blown rose come i'll not be hard upon you as it's the first time you've dealt with me the shawl's worth ten shillings if it's worth a farthing and i'll let you have it for seven shillings and sixpence half a crown down and a shilling a fortnight till it's paid up andrew threw the shawl over her shoulders and turned her round to the envying view of the assembled girls who were not allowed to touch any of his goods with their soiled hands martha softly stroked the bright blue border and felt its texture between her fingers while she deliberated within herself whether she could not buy it from the fund procured by the bilberry picking in the autumn as stephen had never known the full amount she could withdraw the half-crown without his knowledge and the sixpence a week she could save out of her own earnings in ten minutes while andrew was bargaining with some of the others she came to the conclusion that she could not possibly do any longer without a new shawl so telling the packman that she would be back again directly she ran as swiftly as she could over the cinder hills homewards in her hurry to accompany best to the lane she had left her cabin door unfastened never thinking of the danger of the open pit to her blind grandfather and the child little nan had been wearying all morning for a run in the wintry sunshine out of the close steam of washing in the small hut but martha had not dared to let her run about alone as she had been used to do at fern's hollow in their safe garden after martha and black bess had left her the child stood looking wistfully through the open door for some time 
but at last she ventured over the door sill and her tiny feet painfully climbed the frozen bank behind the house whence she could see the group of girls in the lane below perhaps she would have found her way down to them but martha had been cross with her all the morning and the child's little spirit was frightened with her scolding she turned back to the cabin sobbing for the north wind blew coldly upon her and then she must have caught sight of the shaft where stephen had been throwing stones down for her the night before without a thought of the little one trying to pursue the dangerous game alone as martha came over the cinder hill her eyes fell upon little nan rosy laughing screaming with delight as her tiny hands lifted a large stone high above her curly head while she bent over the unguarded margin of the pit but before martha could move in her agony of terror the heavy stone dropped from her small fingers and nan little nan with her rosy laughing face had fallen after it martha never forgot that moment as if with a sudden awaking of memory there flashed across her mind all the child's simple winning ways she seemed to see her dying mother again laying the helpless baby in her arms and bidding her to be a mother to it she heard her father's last charge to take care of little nan when he was also passing away her own wicked carelessness and neglect stephen's terrible sorrow if little nan should be dead all the woeful consequences of her fault were stamped upon her heart with a sudden and very bitter stroke those who were watching her from the lane saw her stand as if transfixed for a moment and then a piercing scream which made every one within hearing start with terror rang through the frosty air as martha sprang forward to the mouth of the old pit and peering down its dark and narrow depths could just discern a little white figure lying motionless at the bottom of the shaft End of chapter 13chapter fourteen of ferns hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org ferns hollow by hesba stretton chapter fourteen a brother's grief in a very short time all the people at work on the surface of the mine knew that stephen fern's little sister was dead lying dead in the very pit where he was then laboring for her with the spirit and strength and love of a father rather than a brother every face was overcast and grave and many of the boys and girls were weeping for little nan had endeared herself to them all since she came to live at the cinder hill cabin tim felt faint and heartsick almost wishing he could have perished in the child's stead for poor stephen's sake but he had to rouse himself for one of the banksmen was going to shout the terrible tidings down the shaft and if stephen should be near instead of being at work farther in the pit the words would fall upon him without any softening or preparation he implored them to wait until he could run and tell miss anne but while he was speaking they saw miss anne herself coming towards the pit her face very pale and sorrowful for the rumour had reached the master's house and she was hastening to meet stephen and comfort him if that were possible oh miss anne cried tim it will kill poor stephen if it come upon him sudden like i know the way through the old pit to where poor little nan had fallen and i'll go and find her the roof's dropped in and only a boy could creep along but who's to tell stevie oh miss anne couldn't you go down with me and tell him gently your own self yes i will go said miss anne weeping underground in those low dark pent-up galleries lighted only here and there by a glimmering lamp the colliers were busy at their labours unconscious of all that was happening overhead stephen was at work at some distance from the others loading a train of small square wagons with the blocks of coal which he and black thompson had picked out of the earth he was singing softly to himself the hymns that he and little nan had been learning during the summer in the red gravel pit 
and he smiled as he fancied that little nan was perhaps singing them over as well by the cabin fire he did not know poor boy that at that moment tim was creeping through the winding blocked up passages so long untrodden to the bottom of the old shaft and that when he returned he would be bearing in his arms a sad sad burden upon which his tears would fall unavailingly stephen's comrades were all of a sudden very quiet and their pickaxes no longer gave dull muffled thumps upon the seam of coal but he was too busy to notice how idle and still they were it was only when cole spoke to him in a tone of extraordinary mildness that the boy paused in his rough and toilsome employment my lad said cole miss anne's coming down the pit and she's asking for thee she promised she'd come some day cried stephen with a thrill of pleasure and a quicker throbbing of his heart as he darted along the narrow paths to the loftier and more open space near the bottom of the shaft where miss anne was waiting for him the covered lamps gave too little light for him to see how pale and sorrow-stricken she looked but the solemn tenderness of her voice sank deeply into his heart stephen my dear boy she said are you sure that i care for you and would not let any trouble come upon you if i could help it yes surely miss anne answered the boy wonderingly your father which is in heaven cares much more for you she continued but whom the lord loveth he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth god is dealing with you as his son stephen can you bear the sorrow which is sent by him if the lord jesus will help me he murmured he will help you my poor boy said miss anne oh stephen stephen how can i tell you our little nan our precious little child has fallen down the old shaft stephen reeled giddily and would have sunk to the ground but cole held him up in his strong arms while his comrades gathered around him with tears and sobs which prevented them uttering any words of consolation but he could not have listened to them he fancied he heard the pattering of nan's little feet and saw her laughing face but no he heard instead the dull and lingering footsteps of tim and saw a little lifeless form folded from sight in tim's jacket the little lass would die very easy whispered cole passing his arm tighter round stephen and she's up in heaven among the angels by this time i reckon stephen drew himself away from cole's arm and staggered forward a step or two to meet tim when he took the sad burden from him and sat down without a word pressing it closely to his breast his perfect silence touched all about him miss anne hid her face in her hands and some of the men groaned aloud the old pit ought to have been bricked up years ago said cole the child's death will be upon the master's head it'll all go to one reckoning muttered black thompson but stephen seemed not to hear their words still with the child clasped tightly to him he waited for the lowering of the skip and when it descended he seated himself in it without lifting up his head which was bent over the dead child miss anne and tim took their places beside him and they were drawn up to the broad glittering light of day on the surface where a crowd of eager bystanders was waiting for stephen's appearance don't speak to me please he murmured without looking round and they made way for him in his deep silent grief as he passed on homewards followed by miss anne once she saw him look up to the hills where at fern's hollow the new house stood out conspicuously against the snow and when they passed the shaft he shuddered visibly but yet he was silent and scarcely seemed to know that she was walking beside him the cabin was full of women from botfield for martha had fallen into a violent fit of hysterics and none of their remedies had any effect in soothing her one of them took the dead child from stephen's arms at the door and bade him go away and sit in her cottage till she came to him but he turned off towards the hills and miss anne seeing that she could say nothing to comfort him just then 
watched him strolling along the old road that led to fern's hollow with his arms folded and his head bent down as if he were still carrying that sad burden which he had borne up from the pit so closely pressed against his heart End of chapter 14chapter fifteen of fern's hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org fern's hollow by hesba stretton chapter fifteen renewed conflict i'm a murderer miss anne said martha with a look of settled despair upon her face on the evening of the next day she had been sitting all the weary hours since morning with her face buried in her hands hearing and heeding no one until miss anne came and sat down beside her speaking to her in her own kind and gentle tones upon a table in the corner of the cabin lay the little form of the dead child covered with a white cloth the old grandfather was crouching over the fire moaning and laughing by turns and stephen was again absent rambling upon the snowy uplands and for murderers there is pardon said miss anne softly oh i never thought i wanted pardon cried martha i always felt i'd done my duty better than any of the girls about here but i've killed little nan and now i remember how cross i used to be when nobody was nigh till she grew quite timorsome of me everybody knows i've murdered her and now it doesn't signify how bad i am i shall never get over that martha said miss anne you're not so guilty of the child's death as my uncle who ought to have had the pit bricked over safely when it was no longer in use but you say you never thought you wanted pardon surely you feel your need of it now but god will never forgive me now replied martha hopelessly i see how wicked i've been but the chance is gone by god will not forgive me now nor stephen we will not talk about stephen said miss anne but i will tell you about god when he gave his commandments to mankind that they might obey them he proclaimed his own name at the same time listen to his name martha the lord the lord god merciful and gracious long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth keeping mercy for thousands forgiving iniquity transgression and sin if you would not go to him for mercy when you did not feel your need of it he was keeping it for you against this time saving and treasuring it up for you that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through jesus christ he is waiting to pardon your iniquity for christ's sake do you wish to be forgiven now do you feel that you are a sinful girl martha i have thought of nothing else all day long whispered martha i have helped to kill little nan by my sins yes said miss anne mournfully if like stephen you had opened your heart to the gentle teaching of the holy spirit if you had looked to jesus trusted in him and followed him this grief would not have come upon you and upon all of us for bess would not have persuaded you to leave your own duties and little nan would have been alive still oh i knew i killed her cried a voice behind them and looking round miss anne saw that the door had been softly opened and bess had crept in unheard her face was swollen with weeping and she stood wringing her hands as she cast a fearful glance at the white covered table in the corner come here bess said miss anne and the girl crept to them and sat down on the ground at their feet miss anne talked long with them about little nan's death until they shed many tears in true contrition of heart for their sinfulness and when they appeared to feel their own utter helplessness 
she explained to them in such simple and easy language as best could understand how they could obtain salvation through faith in the lord jesus christ after which they all knelt down and miss anne prayed earnestly for the weeping and heartbroken girls who as yet hardly knew how they could frame any prayers for themselves when miss anne left the cabin the night was quite dark but the snow which lay unmelted on the mountains showed their outlines plainly with a pale gleaming of light though the sky was overcast with more snow clouds her heart was full of sadness for stephen who was wandering no one knew whither among the snowdrifts on the solitary plains she knew that he must be passing through a terrible trial and temptation but she could do nothing for him her voice could not reach him nor her eye tell him by a silent look how deeply she felt for him yet miss anne knew who it is that possesseth the shields of the earth and in her earnest thanksgiving to god for martha and bess thompson she prayed fervently that the boy might be shielded and sheltered in his great sorrow and that when he was tried he might come forth as gold all the day long stephen instead of going to his work in the pit had been rambling without aim or purpose over the dreary uplands here and there stretching himself upon the wiry heath where the sun had dried away the snow and hiding his face from the light while he gave way to an anguish of grief and broke the deep silence with a loud and very bitter cry it was death sudden death he was lamenting only yesterday morning little nan was clinging strongly to his neck and covering his face with merry kisses and every now and then he felt as if he was only dreaming and he started down towards home as though he could not believe that those tender arms were stiffened and that rosy mouth still in death but before he could run many paces the truth was borne in upon his aching heart that she was surely dead and never more in this life would he see and speak to her or listen to her lisping tongue little nan dearest of all earthly things perhaps dearer to him in the infancy of his christian life than the saviour himself was removed from him so far that she was already a stranger and he knew nothing of her towards evening he found himself in his aimless wandering drawing near to fern's hollow where she had lived the outer shell of the new house was built up the three rooms above and below with a little dairy and coal shed beside them and stephen even in his misery was glad of the shelter of the blank walls from the cutting blast of the north wind for he felt that he could not go home to the cabin where the dead child no longer darling little nan was lying poor stephen he sat down on a heap of bricks upon the new hearth where no household fire had ever been kindled and while the snowflakes drifted in upon him unheeded he buried his face again in his hands and went on thinking as he had been doing all day he would never care to come back now to fern's hollow no he would get away to some far-off country where he should never more hear the master's name spoken let him keep the place he thought and let it be a curse to him for he had bought it with a child's blood if the law gave him back fern's hollow it would not avenge little nan's death and he had no power but the master was a murderer and stephen knelt down on the desolate hearth where no prayer had ever been uttered and prayed god that the sin and punishment of murder might rest upon his enemy was it consolation that filled stephen's heart when he rose from his knees it seemed as if his spirit had grown suddenly harder and in some measure stronger he did not feel afraid now of going down to the cabin where the little lifeless corpse was stretched out and he strode away down the hill with rapid steps when the thought of martha and his grandfather and miss anne crossed his mind it was with no gentle tender emotion but with a strange feeling that he no longer cared for them all his love was gone with little nan only the thought of the master 
and the terrible reckoning that lay before him sent a thrill through his heart i shall be there at the judgment he muttered half aloud looking up to the cold cloudy sky almost as if he expected to see the sign of the coming of the lord but there was no sign there and after gazing for a minute or two he turned in the direction of the cabin where he could see a glimmer of the light within through the chinks of the door and shutter bess and martha were still sitting hand in hand as miss anne had left them but they both started up as stephen entered pale and ghastly from his long conflict with grief and temptation on the hills he had come home conquered though he did not know it and the expression of his face was one of hatred and vengeance instead of sorrow and love he bade black bess to be off and out of his sight in a voice so changed and harsh that both the girls were frightened and martha stole away tremblingly with her he was alone then with his sleeping grandfather on the bed and the dead child lying in the corner from which he carefully averted his eyes when there came a quiet tap at the door and before he could answer it was slowly opened and the master stepped into the cabin he stood before the boy looking into his white face in silence and when he spoke his voice was very husky and low my lad he said i'm very sorry for you and i'll have the pit bricked over at once it had slipped my memory stephen but martha knew of it and she ought to have taken better care of the child it is no fault of mine or it is only partly my fault at any rate but whether or no i've come to tell you i'm willing to bear the expenses of the funeral in reason and here's a sovereign for you besides my lad the master held out a glittering sovereign in his hand but stephen pushed it away and seizing his arm firmly drew him reluctant as he was to the white covered table in the corner there was no look of pain upon the pale placid little features before them but there was an awful stillness and all the light of life was gone out of the open eyes which were fixed into an upward gaze the bible which stephen had not looked for that morning had been used instead of a cushion and the motionless head lay upon it that was little nan yesterday said stephen hoarsely she's gone to tell god all about you you robbed us of our own home and you've been the death of little nan god's curse will be upon you it's no use my cursing i can do nothing but god can punish you better than me a while ago i thought i'd get away to some other country where i'd never hear of you but i'll wait now if i'm almost clemmed to death till i see what god will do at you take your money you've robbed me of all i love but i won't take from you what you love i'll only wait here till i see what god can do he loosed his grasp then and opened the door wide the master muttered a few words indistinctly but he did not linger in the cabin besides that awful little corpse the night had already deepened into intense darkness and stephen standing at the door to listen thought with a quick tingling through all his veins that perhaps the master would himself fall down the open pit but no he passed on securely and martha coming in shortly afterwards ventured to remark that she had just brushed against the master in the lane and wondered where he was going to at that time of night miss anne came to see stephen the next day but though he seemed to listen to her respectfully she felt that she had lost her influence over him and she could do nothing for him but intercede with god that the holy spirit which only can enter into our inmost souls and waken their every memory would in his own good time recall to stephen's heart all the lessons of love and forgiveness he had been learning and enable him to overcome the evil spirit that had gained the mastery over him all the people in botfield wished to attend little nan's funeral but stephen would not consent to it at first he said only tim and himself should accompany the tiny coffin to the churchyard at longville but martha implored so earnestly to go with them that he was compelled to relent the coffin was placed in a little cart 
drawn by one of the hill ponies and led slowly by tim while stephen and martha walked behind the latter weeping many humble and repentant tears as she thought sorrowfully of the little lan but stephen with a set and gloomy face and a heart that pondered only upon the calamities that should overtake his enemy End of chapter 15chapter sixteen of fern's hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org fern's hollow by hesba stretton chapter sixteen softening thoughts but god had not forsaken stephen though for a little time he had left him to the workings of his own sinful nature that he might know of a certainty that in himself there dwelt no good thing god looks down from heaven upon all our bitter conflicts and he weighs as a just judge all the events that happen on earth from the servant to whom he has given but one talent he does not demand the same service as from him who has ten talents stephen's heavenly father knew exactly how much understanding and strength he possessed for he himself had given those good gifts to the boy and he knew in what measure he had bestowed them when the right time was come he sent from above he took him he brought him out of many waters he brought him forth also into a large place he delivered him because he delighted in him after the great tribulation of those days stephen fell into a long and severe illness for many weeks he was delirious and unconscious neither knowing what he said nor who was taking care of him when miss anne sat beside him soothing him as she sometimes could do with singing he would talk of being in heaven and listening to little nan among the angels bess shared many of martha's weary hours of watching and so deeply had the child's death affected them that now all their thoughts and talk were about the things that miss anne diligently taught them concerning jesus and his salvation it was not much that they knew but as in former times a very small subject was sufficient for a long gossip so now the little knowledge of the scriptures that was lodged in either of their minds became the theme of fluent if not very learned conversation sometimes stephen as if their words caught some floating memory would murmur out a verse or two in his delirious ramblings or sing part of a hymn tim also who came for an hour or two every evening was always ready to read the few chapters he had learned and to give the girls his interpretation of them there was no pressing want in the little household though their breadwinner was unable to work the miners made up stephen's wages among themselves at every reckoning for stephen had won their sincere respect though they had often been tempted to ill-treat him miss anne came every day with dainties from the master's house without meeting any reproof or opposition though the name of stephen fern never crossed mr wiley's lips still he used to listen attentively whenever the doctor called upon miss anne to give her his opinion how the poor boy was going on when stephen was recovering his mind was too weak for any of the violent passions that had preceded his illness moreover the bounty of his comrades and the humble kindness of martha and bess came like healing to his soul for very often the tenderness of others will seem to atone for the injuries of our enemies and at least soften our vehement desire for revenge and yet in a quiet listless sort of way stephen still longed for god to prove his wrath against the master's wrongdoing it appeared so strange to hear that all this time nothing had befallen him that he was still strong and healthy and becoming more and more wealthy every day like asaph the psalmist when he considered the prosperity of the wicked stephen was inclined to say 
how doth god know and is there knowledge with the most high behold these are the ungodly that prosper in the earth they increase in riches verily i have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency for all the day long have i been plagued and chastened every morning why does god let these things be he inquired of miss anne one day after he was well enough to rise from his bed and sit by the fire he was very white and thin and his eyes looked large and shining in their sunken sockets but they gazed earnestly into his teacher's face as if he was craving to have this difficulty solved you have asked me a hard question said miss anne we cannot understand god's way for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are his ways than our ways but shall we try to find out a reason why god let these things be for little nan's sake yes said stephen turning away his eyes from her face our lord jesus christ had one disciple called john whom he had loved more than the rest and before john died he was permitted to see heaven and to write down many of the things shown to him that we also might know of them he beheld a holy city whose builder and maker is god and having the glory of god it was built as it were of pure gold and the walls were of all manner of precious stones the gates of the city were of pearl and the streets of gold as clear and transparent as glass there was no need of the sun nor of the moon to shine in it for the glory of god doth lighten it and the lamb is the light thereof he saw too the throne of god and above it there was a rainbow of emerald which was a sign of his covenant with the people upon earth and round about the throne nearer than the angels there were seats upon which men who had been ransomed from this world of sin and sorrow were sitting in white robes and with crowns upon their heads there came a pure river of water of life out of the throne and on each side of the river in the streets of the city there was a tree of life the leaves of which are for the healing of all nations before the throne stood a great multitude which no man could number clothed in white robes and with palms in their hands and as john listened he heard a sound like the voice of many waters and then as it became clearer it seemed like the voice of a great thunder but at last it rang down into his opened ears as the voice of many harpers singing a new song with their harps and he heard a great voice out of heaven proclaiming the covenant of god with men behold the tabernacle of god is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and god himself shall be with them and be their god and god shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain the disciple whom jesus loved saw many other things which he was commanded to seal up but these things were written for our comfort and little nan is there murmured stephen as the tears rolled down his cheeks our lord says of little children i say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my father which is in heaven continued miss anne stephen do you wish her to be back again in this sorrowful world with martha and you for companions instead of the angels oh no sobbed stephen and now why has god sent so many troubles to you my poor stephen as i told you before we cannot understand his ways yet but do you not see that sorrow has made you very different to the other boys about you have you not gained much wisdom that they do not possess and would you change your lot with any one of them would you even be as you were yourself twelve months ago before these afflictions came we are sent into this world for something more than food and clothing and work and play 
our souls must live and they are dead if they are not brought into submission to god's will even our own lord and saviour though he were a son yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered how much more do we need to suffer before we learn obedience to the will of god then there is martha continued miss anne after a pause she and bess are both brought to repentance by the death of our little child surely i need not excuse god's dealings to you any more stephen but there comes no judgment upon the master said stephen in a low voice a flush of pain passed over miss anne's face as she met stephen's eager gaze and saw something of the working of his heart in his flashing eye our god will suffer no sin to go unpunished for ever she answered solemnly vengeance is mine i will repay saith the lord listen stephen when our lord spoke those blessings in your chapter he implied that on the opposite side there were curses corresponding to them but he did not leave this matter uncertain i will read them to you from another chapter but woe unto you that are rich for ye have received your consolation woe unto you that are full for ye shall hunger woe unto you that laugh now for ye shall mourn and lament that is the master said stephen his face glowing with satisfaction for he is rich and full and he laughs now yes but who can tell but that these woes will fall upon my uncle said miss anne and her head drooped low and stephen saw the tears streaming down her cheeks all my prayers and love for him may be lost his soul which is as precious and immortal as ours may perish for ever stephen looked at her bitter weeping with a longing desire to say something to comfort her but he could not speak a word for her grief was caused by the thought of the very vengeance he was wishing for he turned away his head uneasily and gazed deep down into the glowing embers of the fire not my prayers and love only continued miss anne but our saviour's also all his griefs and sorrows may prove unavailing as far as my uncle is concerned perhaps he will say of him i have laboured in vain i have spent my strength for naught and in vain o oh, my saviour because i love thee i would have every immortal soul saved for thy eternal glory and so would i miss anne cried the boy sinking on his knees o oh, miss anne pray to jesus that i may love all my enemies for his sake when miss anne's prayer was ended she left stephen alone to the deep but gentler thoughts that were filling his mind he understood now with a clearness that he had never had before that love is of god and every one that loveth is born of god and knoweth god he must love his enemies because they were precious as he himself had been in all their sin and rebellion to their father in heaven not only did god send rain and sunshine upon the evil and unjust but he had so loved them as to give his only begotten son to die for them and if they perished so far it made the cross of christ of non effect henceforth the bitterness of revenge died out of his heart and whenever he bent his knees in prayer he offered up the dying petition of his namesake the martyr stephen in behalf of all his enemies but especially of his master lord lay not this sin to their charge End chapter 16chapter 17 of ferns hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org ferns hollow by hesba stretton chapter 17 
a new calling stephen's recovery went on so slowly that the doctor who attended him said it would not be fit for him to resume his underground labor for some months to come if he were ever able to do so and advised him to seek out some outdoor employment his old comrades began to find the weekly subscription to make up his wages rather a tax upon their own earnings and stephen himself was unwilling to be a burden upon them any longer as soon therefore as he was strong enough to bear the journey he resolved to cross the hills again to danesford to see when mr lockwood was coming home and what help the clergyman left in charge of his duty could give to him tim brought his father's donkey for him to ride and went with him across the uplands the hard frosts and the snow were over for it was past the middle of march but the house at ferns hollow remained in precisely the same state as when little nan died not a stroke of work had been done at it and a profound silence brooded over the place perhaps the master had lost all pleasure in his ill-gotten possession so changed was stephen though danesford looked exactly the same so tall had he grown during his illness and so white was his formerly brown face that the big boy who had shown him the way to the rectory did not know him again in the least probably mr lockwood and his daughter would not have recognized him but they were still lingering in the warmer climate until the east winds had quite finished their course the strange clergyman however was exceedingly kind to both the boys and promised to send a full and faithful account to mr lockwood of all the circumstances they narrated to him for tim told of many things which stephen passed over they had done right in coming to him he said and he gave stephen enough money to supply the immediate necessities of his family at the same time bidding him apply for more if he needed any for he knew that a boy of his principle and character would never live upon other people's charity whenever he could work for himself how refreshing and strengthening it was upon the tableland that spring afternoon the red leaf buds of the bilberry wires were just bursting forth and the clumps of gorse were tinged with the first golden flowers every kind of moss was there carpeting the ground with a bright fresh green from the moisture of the spring showers as for the birds they seemed absolutely in a frenzy of enjoyment and seemed to forget that they had their nests to build as they flew from bush to bush singing merrily in the sunshine tim wrapped a cloak around stephen and then they faced the breeze gaily as it swept to meet them with a pure breath over miles of heath and budding flowers no wonder that stephen's heart rose within him with a rekindled gladness and gratitude while tim became almost as wild as the birds but stephen began to feel a little tired as they neared ferns hollow though they were still two miles from the cinder hill cabin home home he said rather mournfully pointing to the new house tim i remember when i used to feel in myself as if that was to be my own home forever i didn't think that god only meant it to be mine for a little while even if i kept it till i died and when i thought i was going to die it seemed as if it didn't signify what kind of a place we'd live in or what troubles had happened to us yesterday tim miss anne showed me a verse about us being strangers and pilgrims upon the earth perhaps we are pilgrims replied tim but we aren't much strangers on these hills it means said stephen that we are no more at home here than a stranger is when he is passing through botfield i'm willing now never to go back to ferns hollow if god pleases not that little nan is gone but because i'm sure god will do what is best with me and where to have no continuing city here i think i shouldn't feel a bit angry if i saw other people living there hello what's that cried tim surely it could not be smoke from the top of the new chimney yes a thin clear blue column of smoke was curling briskly up into the air and then floating off in a banner over the hillside 
Somebody was there, that was certain, and the first fire had been lighted on the hearthstone. There was a sharp pang in Stephen's heart, and he cast down his eyes for a moment, but then he looked up to the sky above him with a smile, while Tim set up a loud shout and urged the donkey to a canter. "'It's Martha!' he cried. "'I saw her gown peeping round the corner of the wall. I'll lay a wager it's her print gown. Come thy ways. We'll make sure afore we pass.' It was Martha waiting for them at the old wicket, and Bess was just within the doorway. They were come so far to meet the travellers, and had even prepared tea for them in the new kitchen, having cleared away some of the bricks and mortar, and raised benches with the pieces of planks left about. Tea was just ready for Stephen's refreshment, and he felt that he was in the greatest need of it, so they sat down to it as soon as Martha had laid out the provisions, among which was a cake sent by Miss Anne. The fire of wood chips blazed brightly and gave out a pleasant heat, and every one of the little party felt a quiet enjoyment, though there were many tender thoughts of little Nan. We may be pilgrims, said Tim reflectively over a slice of cake but there's lots of pleasant things sent us by the way they were still at tea when the gamekeeper who was passing by and who guessed from the smoke from the chimney and the donkey grazing in the new pasture that some gypsies had taken possession of fern's hollow and came to look through the unglazed window he had not seen stephen since his illness and there was something in his wasted face and figure which touched even him "'I'm sorry to see thee looking so badly, my lad,' he said. "'I must speak to my missus to send you something nourishing, "'for I've not forgotten you, Stephen. "'If there ever comes a time when I can speak up about any business of yours "'without hurting myself, you may depend upon me. "'But I don't like making enemies, "'and the Bible says we must live peaceably with all men. "'I heard talk of you wanting some outdoor work for a while.' and there's my wife's brother is wanting a shepherd's boy he'd take you at my recommendation and i'd be glad to speak a word for you would that do for you stephen accepted the offer gladly and when the gamekeeper was gone they sang a hymn together so blotting out by an offering of praise the evil prayer which he had uttered upon that earth on the night of his desolation and strong conflict pleasant was the way home to the old cabin in the twilight pleasant the hearty good night of tim and bess but most pleasant of all was the calm sense of truth and the submissive will with which stephen resigned himself to the providence of god the work of a shepherd was far more to stephen's taste than his dangerous toil as a collier from his earliest years he had been accustomed to wander with his grandfather over the extensive sheep walks seeking out any strayed lambs or diligently gathering food for the sick ones of the flock to be sure he could only earn little more than half his former wages and his time for returning from his work would always be uncertain and often very late but then sorrowful consideration there was no little nan to provide for now nor to fill up his leisure hours at home martha was earning money for herself and as yet the master had demanded no rent for their miserable cabin so his earnings as a shepherd's boy would do until mr lockwood came back still upon the mountains he would be exposed to the bleak winds and heavy storms of the spring while underground the temperature had always been the same no wonder that miss anne when she looked at the boy's wasted and enfeebled frame listened with unconcealed anxiety to his new project for gaining his livelihood and so often as the spring showers swept in swift torrents across the sky lifted up her eyes wistfully to the unsheltered mountains as she pictured stephen at the mercy of the pitiless storm End of chapter 17。Chapter 18 of Fern's Hollow。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Ferns Hollow by Hesba Stretton. Chapter 18 The Pantry Window. Stephen had been engaged in his new calling for about a fortnight and was coming home after a long and toilsome day among the flocks two hours after sunset with a keen east wind bringing tears to his eyes when he was a few paces from his cabin door a tall dark figure sprang up from a hollow in the cinder hill and laid a heavy hand upon his shoulder it was just light enough to discern the gloomy features of black thompson and stephen inquired fearlessly what he wanted with him i thought thee'd never be coming said black thompson impatiently lad hast thee forgotten thy rights and thy wrongs hath thou come to yonder wretched kennel whistling as if all the land belonged to thee where is thy promise to thy father that thee'd never give up thy rights jackson the butcher has taken ferns hollow and it's to be finished in a week or two, and thee'll see thine own place go into the hands of strangers. It'll all be put right some day, Thompson. Thank you, said Stephen. Right, repeated Thompson. Who's to put wrong things right if we won't take the trouble ourselves? Is it right for the master to grind us down in our wages and raise the rents over our heads till we can scarcely get enough to keep us in victuals? just that he may add money to money to count over of nights was it right of him to leave the pit yonder open till little nan was killed in it thee has a heavy reckoning to settle with him and i'd be wiping off some of the score if i was in thy place i should have little nan's voice calling me day and night from the pit to ask when i was going to revenge her black thompson felt that stephen trembled under his grasp and he went on with greater earnestness thee could revenge thyself this very night thee could get the worth of ferns hollow without a risk if thee'd listen to me it's thine own lad and thy wrongs are heavy ferns hollow stolen from thee and the little ass murdered how canst thee rest stephen god will repay said stephen in a tremulous voice dost think that god sees asked black thompson scoffingly if he sees he doesn't care what does it matter to him that poor folks like us are trodden down and robbed if he cared he could strike the master dead in a moment and he doesn't he lets him prosper and prosper till nobody can stand before him i'd take my own matter in my own hands and make sure of vengeance god doesn't take any notice i'm sure god sees answered stephen he's everywhere and he isn't blind or deaf only we don't understand what he's going to do yet if he didn't take any notice of us he wouldn't make me feel so happy spite of everything oh thompson thee and the men were so kind to me when i couldn't work and i've never seen thee to thank thee i can do nothing for thee except i could persuade thee to repent and be as happy as i am oh i'll repent some day said black thompson loosing stephen's arm but i've lots of things to do aforehand and i reckon they can all be repented of together so lad it's true what everybody is saying of thee thee has forgotten poor little nan and thy promise to thy father no i've never forgotten replied stephen but i'll never try to revenge myself now i couldn't if i did try besides i've forgiven the master so don't speak to me again about it thompson well lad be sure i'll never waste my time thinking of thee again said black thompson with an oath thy religion has made a poor spiritless cowardly chap of thee and i've done with thee altogether black thompson strode away into the darkness and was quickly out of hearing while stephen stood still and listened to his rapid footsteps turning over in his mind what mischief he wished to tempt him to now the open shaft was only a few feet from him but it had been safely encircled by a high iron railing instead of being bricked over as it had been found of use in the proper ventilation of the pit from thompson and his temptation stephen's thoughts went swiftly to little nan and how he had heard her calling to him upon that dreadful night when he went away with the poachers was it possible that he could forget her for a single day 
was she not one of his most constant and most painful thoughts yes he could remember every pretty look of her face and every sweet sound of her voice and yet they were saying he had forgotten her while the pit was there for him to pass night and morning a sorrowful reminder of her dreadful death a sharp thrill ran through stephen's frame as his outstretched hand caught one of the iron railings which rattled in its socket but his very heart stood still when up from the dark narrow depths there came a low and stifled cry of stephen stephen he was no coward though black thompson had called him one but this voice from the dreaded pit at that dark and lonely hour made him tremble so greatly that he could neither move nor shout aloud for very fear he leaned there holding fast by the railing with his hearing made wonderfully acute and his eyes staring blindly into the dense blackness beneath him in another second he detected a faint glimmer like a glow-worm deep down in the earth and the voice still muffled and low came up to him again it's only me tim it cried hush don't speak stephen don't make any noise i'm left down in the pit they're going to break into the master's house tonight they're going to get thee to creep through the pantry window if thee won't jack davies is to go they'll fire the thatch if they can't get the door open thee go and take care of miss anne and send martha to longville for help don't trust anybody at botfield these sentences sounded up into stephen's ears one by one slowly as tim could give his voice its due tone and strength he recollected instantly all the long oppression the men had suffered from their master in that distant part of the county where there were extensive works the colliers had been striking for larger wages and some of them had strolled down to botfield bringing with them an increase of discontent and inquietude which had taken deep root in the minds of all the workpeople it was well known that the master kept large sums of money in his house which as i have told you was situated among lonely fields nearly a mile from botfield and no one lived with him except miss anne and one maid servant it was a very secure building with stone casements and strongly barred doors but if a boy could get through the pantry window he could admit the others readily how long it would be before the attempt was made stephen could not tell but it was already late and black thompson had left him hurriedly but at least it must be an hour or two nearer midnight and all hopes of rescue and defence rested upon him and martha only martha was sitting by the fire knitting and bess thompson was pinning on her shawl to go home poor bess even in his excitement stephen felt for her but he dared not utter a word until she was gone but then martha could not credit his hurried tidings and directions until she had been herself to the shaft to see the feeble glim of tim's lamp and hear the sound of his voice for as soon as she rattled the railings he spoke again be sharp he cried i'm not afeard but i can't stay here where little nan died i'll go back to the pit and wait till morning be sharp there was no need after that to urge martha to hasten after throwing a shawl over her head she started off for longville with the swiftness of a hare and was soon past the engine house and threading her way cautiously through botfield where she dreaded to be discovered as she passed the lighted windows or across the gleam of some open door many of the houses were quite closed up and dark but in some there was a voice of talking and here and there martha saw a figure stealing like herself along the deepest shadows but she escaped without being noticed and once through the village her path lay along the silent high roads straight on to longville nor did stephen linger in the cinder hill cabin he ran swiftly over the pit banks and stole along by the lime kilns and the blacksmith's shop for under the heavy door he could see a little fringe of light how loudly the dry cinders crunched under his careful footsteps yet quiet as the blacksmith's shop was and soundless as the night without 
the noise did not reach the ears of those who were lurking within and stephen went on in safety there stood the master's house at last black and massive looking against the dark sky not a gleam from fire or candle to be seen below for every window was closely shuttered but on the second story there shone a lighted casement which stephen knew belonged to the master's chamber the dog which came often with miss ander the cinder hill cabin gave one loud bay and then sprang playfully upon stephen as if to apologize for his mistake in barking at him for some minutes the boy stood in deep deliberation scarcely daring to knock at the door lest some of the housebreakers should be already concealed near the spot and rush upon him before it was opened or else enter with him into the defenceless dwelling but at length he gave one very quiet rap with his fingers and after a minute's pause his heart bounded with joy as he heard miss anne herself asking who was there stephen fern he answered with his lips close to the keyhole and speaking in his lowest tones what is the matter stephen she asked i cannot open the door for my uncle always takes the keys with him into his own room please to take the light into the pantry for one minute he whispered cautiously with a fervent hope that miss anne would do so without requiring any further explanations for he was lost if black thompson or davies were lying in wait near at hand very thankfully he heard miss anne's step across the quarried floor and in a moment afterwards the light shone through a low window close by it was unglazed with the screen of open lattice-work over it so as to allow a free ventilation it had one thick stone upright in the middle leaving such a narrow space as only a boy could creep through he examined the opening quickly and carefully while the light remained and when miss anne returned to the door he whispered again through the keyhole don't be afraid it's me stephen i'm coming in through the pantry window he knew his danger he knew if any of the robbers came up they must hear him removing the wooden lattice which was laid over the opening and unless they supposed it to be one of their accomplices at work he would be at once in their power exposed to their ill treatment or perhaps suffer death at their hands and would miss anne within trust to him instead of alarming the master if he came down and opened the door all the designs of the evil men would be hastened and finished before martha could return from longville but stephen did not listen nor did his fingers tremble over their work though there was a rush of thoughts and fears through his brain he tore away the lattice as quickly and quietly as he could and with one keen glance round at the dark night he thrust his head through the narrow frame he found it was just possible to crush through and after a minute's struggle his feet rested upon the pantry floor End of chapter eighteen